You may see this face and recognize this monster. He's from the 1927 Lon Chaney silent film, London After Midnight, directed by Todd Browning. But you may be surprised to learn that despite being recognized worldwide, there isn't a single movie that you can go watch him in today. The film doesn't exist anymore. The last known copy was destroyed in a warehouse fire at MGM in 1965, and since then, academic work has strived to piece together all they can about what this film was, using existing promotional stills, surviving parts of scripts, even Lon Chaney's personal notes about his makeup, to assemble an idea of what this film might have looked like. Turner Classic Movies funded a 45-minute recreation of the film, using still images from the production that were kept in an MGM storage facility. And one of the only reasons that we know what the plot of this movie was is because of its novelization, published the same year as the film's release. Copies of that still remain, that served as an invaluable tool in historical preservation research. Now, not all novelizations are as important as that one, clearly but they do hold an important place in the landscape of pop culture. For a long time, they sort of serve the purpose of the home release of a movie before the time of VHS, where you could own a personal version of a film that you loved in theaters and could experience it again in a new way. In a time before you could just sit down and watch Star Wars anytime that you wanted to, the novelization, which sold millions of copies, was the next best thing. Now. Historically, these things that are usually seen as disposable secondary work have been an effort made by fans of those properties who are devoted to keeping them popular, as is tradition in all lines of art. Fan creations are often the unthanked custodial efforts that continue to support brands for decades, even occasionally impacting the direction of the brands themselves. Do you think Star Wars or Star Trek would be continuing in the style that it is today? if there had not been a dedicated fandom supporting it consistently over time, even through its darker periods. Encyclopocalypse is a book publishing company that produces a number of different types of products, chief among them, novelizations. Both reprints of older novelizations as well as newer ones made by fans for pre-existing movies. They make some quality work, their cover design is great, and in general they have a wide range of horror titles to choose from spread across many subgenres. On their website, they describe themselves as follows. The archiving of the written word is one of the oldest and most important practices in human history. Encyclopocalypse was founded as a place where books can live on. From independent novels to literature published before the digital age, our goal is to create a home for every great book that hasn't yet been heard. So, so far, great stuff, right? But this isn't actually a video about a book that was published by this company. This is a video about a session of online harassment and bullying. Because of the publication of a different book instigated by this man, Sean C. Durager, the managing editor of Encyclopocalypse, who over the course of several days led an online effort to seriously embarrass a younger writer who was just getting his start. Instead of leading through an example of kindness, even going so far as to tagging authorities to squash any differing opinions in the conversation. To me, what you're about to see is a parable of why you shouldn't use your platform to be cruel in such a small community, or ever really. It is also a story about how the internet can rip a completely random innocent person apart, just for the fun of it. Without any thought, just for a momentary hit of dopamine superiority. Without even thinking or caring about how it impacts them. I don't say this kind of thing often, but just on a personal level, I've never really liked Sean. I don't like the way that he talks to people. I don't like the way that he conducts himself online. This is all something I would normally, under no circumstances, admit to in public. But he's upset me pretty badly with what he's done here. He's one of those rise and grind kind of mindset guys that give off the worst kind of energy. He tweeted only several days before all this began that sometimes it feels like I've been spinning my wheels for almost a decade and getting nowhere. Gonna keep fucking grinding, hashtag never give up and his behavior that we'll see here that he showed over the next few days only demonstrates to me that he's the kind of person who, on a professional level, would push you over and try and get ahead instead of lifting you up so that you can take the journey together. After looking at how he handled the situation, I couldn't ever imagine working with him on anything. 
On May 4th of this year, a listing was made on Amazon for an unauthorized adaptation of 1989's Halloween 5, written by an unknown author who goes by the name Jake Martin. Not much is known about Jake at all. This is his first novel. He seems to be a very private person with next to no online presence. I've now spoken with him several times through text and on the phone, and he's very worried about protecting his identity because of the harassment that he has already received. In one of our earliest messages, he told me, I fear that I might have to make significant changes to my social media presence to avoid further harassment that I've already endured. The internet has a dark side, and I'm witnessing it firsthand. In the foreword to the book, which was obviously written long before any of this unfolded, he makes it very clear what he intended this project to be. And I personally think that it's a great idea. What follows is that foreword in entirety, because I believe it is relevant to be included here to understand the situation. For the past nine months, I've poured my heart and soul into writing, editing, and self-publishing, the book that is currently in your hands. As a lifelong fan of the Halloween franchise, I wanted to fill the void left after the release of Halloween 4 and offer a fresh take on the fifth film. I spent countless hours researching, re-watching the film, and studying the screenplay in order to create a faithful and engaging adaptation that would satisfy not only myself, but most importantly, the loyal fanbase. Despite the arduous process, I approached the task with love and respect for the franchise, its fans, and the original screenwriters. I was determined to capture the essence of the original story and bring my own unique voice to that project. It was a labor of love, and I hope that comes through on the page. As I delved into the project, I encountered challenges in rectifying continuity errors and filling in gaps left by the rush production of Halloween 5. With two scripts and the film itself as my references, I rewrote several parts of the story and added new scenes to both frighten and explain certain elements. My goal was to tie the story more fluidly with the original films and what would come next in Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. Self-publishing the novelization was a careful process to avoid any legal entanglements. My ultimate hope is the team at Trancus International will see my novelization as a fan's love letter to their product, rather than a commercial venture designed to infringe upon their rights and tossing my work into the bin. If you're so willing, I invite you to read my novelization of Halloween 5 and share your thoughts with me at Redacted. I hope that my work will be a welcome addition to the Halloween universe and that it will provide fans with a new and exciting way to experience the story. In the acknowledgement for the book, the following paragraph can be found. To all you diehard Halloween fans out there, I hope my novelization lives up to your expectations. I know us fans can be a tricky bunch to impress. I'm not doing this for the dough, clearly, but to pay tribute to the series that made me fear the dark and Bill Shatner. On the back of the novel, the text can be found that reads, unofficial and unlicensed, for entertainment purposes only. At another point when talking with me, he was very concerned that he's been painted as someone who's trying to start up this massive pirate commercial venture. He told me, one thing I really want to drive home is that I didn't do this to steal or make money, that I'm a fan first and foremost. Hell, I've given Trances International more money than I would have ever made on that book the way that it is. I own a lot of their products. The copyright issue did weigh on me when I clicked publish. Amazon's KDP system let it go through. One thing that I would like to say on this also is that so often established people's advice to young creators is to go make something that you want to see exist in the world. Halloween 5 is a notoriously bad movie, especially within the context of the other films in the franchise that it is supposedly canon to. And what he did here was attempt to take all of those dropped loose threads and tried to make a Halloween 5 that works as a cohesive narrative within the franchise at large. And I think that's super cool. He tried to make the story of Halloween actually function like a story should, which is no small feat. As Jake told me, it's labeled as an unofficial and fan-made novelization to one of the worst films in a long-running series. This one is like 35 years old. It was shot without a completed script. It had at least three cooks in the kitchen and made little sense. At least I tried to put the pieces together. And here's the thing too to keep in mind. The book is actually quite good. I've not finished it yet. I'm a bit of a slow reader, but I do have a copy. And Jake is a very strong, young writer 
who knows what he's doing and has a voice for this specific period of slasher novels. He clearly wanted to do a good job and treat this as an actual serious project. He told me in one of our conversations, Once I start, it feels like two seconds and I've got 2,000 words on the page. The editing for Halloween 5 took me the longest time. The first drafting process took about four months for 40,000 words, in between a full-time job and a periodical social life. The next four edits took the remaining six months of major additions and word choice changes. I could edit myself into oblivion. This is a clear project that comes from the heart, from a place of love and passion for this franchise. It was never intended to be a commercial venture. Not that it would matter if it was actually good or not. Its quality doesn't have an impact on the treatment that he received online and whether that was justified or not. But for the record, it is a good, solid, polished, professional piece of writing. So you may be wondering, where is the issue here? Where's the controversy? Well, you see, Jake first went to Sean and Encyclopocalypse when trying to find a way to distribute his fan novelization. He says that he picked Encyclopocalypse because he already owned a great deal of their books and loved and respected what they did as a company. They inquired about the rights to the novel on Halloween 5 for him, were told that there was an issue and that the rights were tied up in some legal entanglement and that they could not publish it and that they would not be working with Jake on this project. That should have been the end of their part in the story, but it wasn't. Desperate to have this work be seen and shared by fans of the franchise, Jake then went and published and distributed the book himself online. If there's an issue here at all, it's that the book got through Amazon's personal requirements for publishing through their platform. If anyone was to get angry at anyone, it should have been directed at them. But from where I stand, it should have just been a complete non-issue in general. So this is going to be a bit difficult because some of the original tweets have been deleted, but I'm going to try and present you with as accurate of a timeline that I can put together of how all of this went down online. And what you will see, in my opinion, are just some pretty bad faith takes trying to punch down at Jake for publishing his unauthorized work. At 6.03 Eastern Time on the 17th, the event began. Sean tweeted the following about Jake's unofficial novelization. So you have balls of steel to self-publish an unauthorized novelization of Halloween 5, especially since there's one written by an author who's written a legit entry, but he's played by the rules for decades and never published it. It's frustrating as hell that this even got through the at Amazon KDP approval process. We jump through hoops, have all the proper contracts and authorizations for our books, and yet some schlub can just publish Halloween 5 with zero permission. Here you can find quite a few replies, some of which, very disappointingly, came from notable people within the horror community, all expressing that they're happy that this person is going to be taken down a peg, that he's going to learn his place for daring to make and distribute fan art. In the thread for this, fellow YouTuber The Horror Geek said in what I view as an extremely cruel way, not sure what's more stunning here, that someone wasted a chunk of their life writing a novelization of one of the shittiest Halloween films or that he thought that it was totally okay to do this without acquiring the rights. To this, Sean replied, What's even more stunning is that he's acting the victim, and a ton of other authors have jumped to his side. Oh well, as at DC Talk official said, some people gotta learn the hard way. Author Richard Humphrey said to the original post, Wow, that's wow. Sean responds with, He even asked my advice and I told him not to write it. Well, he did. Then I told him we could never publish it because of the rights issues. Well, he did. Idiot. At another place, he says a similar comment. LOL. He approached us to publish it. We told him the rights were unavailable. Hopefully he doesn't get sued. I know you don't need to be told this, but this clearly gives the energy that he does actually, in fact, want him to be sued and legally be made an example of. All of Sean's tweets about this have an air of really hoping that Jake would spontaneously combust from the pressures of the internet. Also, get this, you can't make something like this up. So at 11.40 p.m. on the 18th, the very next day, in reaction to Disney getting rid of their Willow show on Disney+, Plus, Sean said, Guess I'll have to buy a bootleg of Willow. That statement right there entirely invalidates everything that he said about Jake's book on any professional level. He clearly does not care about copyright laws. He couldn't give a shit. He just cares 
that he used his position's power to say no to someone, and then couldn't handle it when they went and did it for themselves. And then had to go and throw a very public tantrum from his position of authority, and in the process hurt someone's mental health severely. Jake has expressed to me extreme embarrassment over what happened next. To try and calm down the mob, he attempted to appease Sean and make him back off from his attacks, which did not work. Apologizing for something that he shouldn't have ever had to apologize for, because he didn't do a thing to Sean. He said in that original thread, I am incredibly regretful at the moment. A first-timer who made a critical error in judgment. In all, 34 went out in both print and Kindle. If that means that I'm blacklisted for this, it is what it is. I enjoyed writing it, but you're absolutely right. I should have listened. After serious consideration and, well, my abject stupidity, I'm removing the book from the marketplace. It was a mistake beyond measure to publish it. I hope it was enjoyable for the few that got a copy, but those will be all that exist. My apologies for not listening to you. He's since deleted those tweets. The next day, Jake would take down his listing from Amazon. They never directly got involved in the situation. It needs to be clearly stated that Amazon never took the book down. That night after the delisting at 8.16 p.m., Sean tweeted an image showing that Halloween 5 had been taken down, wagging his finger and saying, LOL, good. I hope you learned your lesson here, Jake. The name inclusion in the tweet has such an essence of smugness and self-satisfaction at what he's done here. Someone in the comments asks for clarification on this post and he says, It was a bootleg novelization. The author ignored my advice when he asked me if he should write it. I said no. I told him the rights were unavailable. He wrote it and self-published it. It's his first novel. Over the next few days, he says the same thing over and over and over again. Watch as he just constantly frames the situation, as he's the only authority that needs to be listened to. That he clearly thinks that Jake is some unintelligent rube that needs to be punished for what he's done, and never once mentions that Amazon is at least to blame in this situation for allowing the book to exist on the marketplace to begin with. He just narcissistically can't get over the fact that someone didn't take his advice. Some dude wrote a Halloween 5 novelization. I checked the rights told him they were unavailable. He published it himself. Now he's apparently a martyr. He wrote a little bit. I told him it wasn't worth pursuing. He didn't listen. I'm a publisher. He came to me for advice on rights, agents, and publishing. I gave him that advice. I handle novelization rights daily. I have dealt with the actual rights holders. So my advice was trying to help him avoid being sued. But you all do whatever you want. Hey, you want to play legal chicken with Hollywood Studios? Be my fucking guest. As a publisher who works on novelizations, we'd be idiots not to get the rights on this stuff. This guy approached us wanting to publish it, we checked into it, and legally, not a good idea. You want an explanation? It's annoying, because the dude came to us, a publisher who does novelizations, asked if he could do the thing. I literally checked on the rights, said no, he shouldn't, and he did it anyways. Okay, fine, write fanfiction. Then he put it on Amazon. As a filmmaker and screenwriter, it should bother you that it's so easy for someone to try and make money off your original work. I literally did my due diligence for this guy to track down and get an answer on where the rights sit, advised him it wasn't a good idea, and he did it anyways. Then I had friends buying it, thinking it was a legit novelization, not a good look, and the rights holders wouldn't be as forgiving, but whatever, done explaining myself. Also, if Sean actually cared about people not seeing this and didn't want people to buy it, and didn't want his friends to know about it or see it, then he shouldn't have said anything at all. In the two weeks that the book was on Amazon, it only sold a handful of copies in total. But in between Sean tweeting about it and Jake taking down the listing was when the bulk of the sales happened. Sean did more marketing for this book than anybody else. Author B.R. Yeager, who wrote the recent Burn You the Fuck Alive, as well as negative space, stepped into the conversation and said in a now-deleted tweet, Saw some squares tisk-tisking this guy for writing and self-publishing this very unauthorized novelization, rather than going through the proper channels. And I'm just here to say, everyone should do this. It's freaking awesome. Copyright was made to be broken. Now, Jake has asked me to make it clear that while he is very much appreciative of Jaeger's defense, that he also does not want it to characterize his personal stance and position. 
he wants it to be clear that what he was doing was first and foremost done in tribute and that he feels that you should not be able to break copyright to start a massive business venture to actually try and harm a business competitor. Citing as an example, Never Say Never Again, a wide release bootleg James Bond film produced by Warner Brothers that actually even starred Sean Connery where copyright was being infringed upon purposefully in an attempt to hurt the rights holder's image, Eon Productions, who made the legitimate Bond movies, with his exact words being, copyright has a place for a reason, within reason. Sean then quoted Jaeger's statement saying, so do authors have lawsuit money stashed away somewhere? Fine, knock yourself out. Good luck with that shit. I'll be over here being a fucking square, legitimately publishing shit. In the comments for this, the really disappointing moment for me personally was when author Laurel Hightower, who before this I actually respected quite a lot, said, yeah, I choked at that, waiting for the how it's going follow-up that's actually a GoFundMe to pay for legal expenses. To this, Sean said, let's just say the rights holders have been notified, so we'll see if anyone changes their tune. Hall monitor badges should be handed out to every single one of these wannabe cops. That whole exchange is a microcosm of capitalist rot, gleefully hoping that corporate lawyers come down on this guy and ruin his life for daring to make a pittance of money on the Halloween brand name. I made a video about Halloween and I made money on it. Do I deserve to go to jail? I'm making another one that you're watching right now and I'll make money on this too. People who have done cover art for Hightower's books have all at one point or another made fan art and then used that fan art to grow their online brand that led them to getting jobs. In essence, eventually profiting off that fan work. Do they deserve to go to jail too? And if you think about it, Laurel, if you or your publishers are hiring these artists, to make covers for you that have much larger online presences than you yourself have, to boost your career and sales, then aren't you too profiting off their fan works? Do you deserve to go to jail? I mean, who was Jake hurting actually? Why do you even care? Corporations don't need you to defend them, and they certainly don't need you to snitch on smaller creators. In a different now deleted tweet that I also believe came from Jaeger, although I'm not entirely certain about that, Talking about the nature of piracy, Sean started tagging different horror publishers to snitch on him about his dirty views on art and to try and hurt his livelihood. At another point, he quote tweets Jaeger and says, hey authors, rip this guy's book. He thinks copyright is bullshit. A few days later, a thread was making fun of someone demanding free screeners and Garrick Dion, producer on films like Drive, Whiplash, Nightcrawler, and Capone said, Feel like this guy and the Halloween 5 novelization guy need to get together and start a losers club. And to him, I gotta say, do you realize that in this instance you're using a Stephen King reference from the anti-bullying novel to bully someone that you don't even know? Horror should be about inclusion. Most importantly, it should be about kindness. But this mindset is like a toxic circle of high school cliques. Let's for demonstration's sake run a few scenarios, shall we? Person A makes a thing that they're proud of, but they do not have a large platform or way to share that with anyone. Person B is someone who does have a large platform and takes that thing and reposts it without attribution or even just claims it as their own. Harm has transpired in this situation against person A who is a small independent creator. I hope we can all agree on that. That's just basic logic, right? Okay, so let's say person A from the first scenario is here again who has made a thing that they like but has no real way to distribute it. Person B steps in who is a massive company and either steals their work outright or pays them less than what they're worth and goes on to make millions of dollars through exploitation. In that situation, harm has transpired again on person A by greed incentivized corporate vampires. Okay, third scenario. Person A this time is a multi-conglomerate of a company with a market cap in the billions of dollars. Or say that we're talking about Apple or Amazon, trillions of dollars. Person B is someone who draws a picture at a convention of a character who appears in one of their movies and sells it to someone for $50. Now, can you genuinely look me in the eye and tell me in good faith that you believe that harm has transpired? That is just a representation of how fandom has operated for decades. Halloween 5 is not a person. It doesn't have a singular creator. It is a product in a massive worldwide recognized franchise made for a corporation by people who were hired explicitly to make this product for that corporation 
that came out in 1989. It has for almost four decades now made Compass Pictures millions of dollars. One of the last times that I was in New York last year, Times Square was covered in giant billboards featuring Michael Myers and Laura Strode for Halloween Inns. We aren't talking about some small property made by a devoted single person. I've spoken with Jake about this, and after production and shipping, he made a grand total of, get this, $26.85. This whole thing has been over somebody making a profit of 20 bucks. And also, he didn't even actually get that money at all, as Amazon KDP or Kindle Direct Publishing, similarly to YouTube, requires your account to have a minimum of $100 in it before they'll do a payout. When he first reached out to me, Jake said the following, which was the moment that I knew I wanted to publicly talk about this, because reading his words really broke my heart. None of what has transpired is what I expected. Critique the prose all you wish, but no one read the damn thing. This is all about its publication. I made a whopping $20 on it by the time I took it down, and it was up for two weeks. And for the record, I removed it from sale myself. I priced it low and wasn't going in this to make money at all. I just wanted people to be able to have it in print in an accessible way. Amazon KDP was the only way to make that happen. I wasn't trying to steal possible revenue or steal the spotlight from a company. I wasn't trying to disrespect the screenwriters. I wasn't trying to make anyone mad. Quite the opposite, in fact. I'm beside myself on all of this. It hurts beyond measure. My first book, 10 months of my life, countless edits, and I'm told no by people who don't even own the original work. By gatekeepers who serve gatekeepers. It was done as tribute and love for a franchise I adore. I feel really exposed and horrifically embarrassed by all of this. Now Sean, if I were to speak directly to you, I would say that I imagine having someone who has a much larger public platform than you, talking about you very publicly in a way that you can't control, with an intent purpose of embarrassing you is a very unpleasant feeling to go through. It's not a very nice thing to do. I couldn't imagine. It isn't nice to publicly use your platform to spotlight someone substantially smaller than you in a negative light, is it? To punch down at them. To make them squirm with the public position that you've been trusted in is a cruel thing to do. Don't you think, Sean? Couldn't you imagine now that this is an absolutely horrible thing to go through? To put someone that you don't even know through this? to make them feel miserable and worthless about themselves, to use the internet as a weapon against someone to make them feel small, weak, insignificant, and vulnerable, to make them naked to the masses. Isn't that a genuinely awful thing to do to someone? If you were to go to any convention in America, you would essentially find the same kinds of things. Rows and rows of tables and booths, selling merchandise for movies that are 40 years old. If what you have said about Jake's book is really your honest-to-God true opinion, you should be against the very idea of horror conventions in general, right, Sean? I bet you've tweeted a lot about how angry you are at those. I mean, surely everyone selling plushies, blankets, fan art, pins, figures, and other merchandise of Michael Myers does not have express written permission to do that, right? They are a hotbed of illicit activity and must be stopped, right? Should those people go to jail too? Should they have their lives ruined? Or are you more upset that somebody is doing something that you don't like after you told them they couldn't do it? Are you mad that you can't control this person? Are you trying to make an example of them so that others don't stand in the way of your business? Has your brain been so warped by capitalism that you see your fellow man as a weasel that has to be squashed in the mud? Horror is a transgressive art form. Horror is punk. Do you think tagging Amazon on Twitter to tattletale and send lawyers after someone is punk? Do you think that that is what this is all about? Bootlicking and alerting authorities because a guy made $20 on a personal passion project is so against the mindset of horror that honestly, if I were you, I would just take a deep, introspective moment to question just how you got here. You've been a bully. What you did was so unimaginably cruel. He might not ever write again because of you. You may have robbed him of his life's passion and joy, just so you can seem like a big man on Twitter. I was so upset to watch all of this transpire over a few days online that I decided to sit down with Jake and hear his side of all this, because nobody else seemed particularly interested in doing that. Nobody even knows who he is, but they seem to have a lot of opinions about him, 
I wanted to see what he felt about how all of this went down, how it affected him. To keep his identity private, he requested that his image or voice not be used here in this. So what follows is a partial edited transcript of our recorded conversation. I guess where I want to start is with your first encounters with Sean, pitching the book. How long were you in contact, and how did that process work? I had emailed him. It must have been in October. I have all the emails. I emailed him again, it looks like late April, so just about a month ago. I said, Hi there. A while back I emailed you, letting you know I was working on a novelization for Halloween 5. And then I told him what I had done, and said I don't have an agent, don't own the rights to the work, that I could use some help in a few ways, and that perhaps he could help me even if he didn't take the work. I said, if you want to take a look at it, I'll send you a PDF copy of the novel. I sent him the initial 57,000 word draft. He got back to me saying that the rights holders were not interested in a novelization, and that he was very sorry. That was the last time I heard from him before the tweet started. I want you to go through and explain the emotions as all of this played out as best as you can remember. What you felt when you realized what was happening. Walk me through what you were feeling in those first few days. I was at work, and I had a break period, so I was just kind of getting my Twitter thing going to start with. I started Twitter to promote the book, and I didn't do a whole lot of promoting yet, because to be fairly honest with you, my dad is still working on the final touches with the edits, and my plan was to do a proper full push for it. But I wanted to get a few people to read it first. I did have it out there. It had been out for two weeks and I was curious to see if anyone had bought it, posted about it, said anything about it. So I did a search for Halloween 5 on Twitter, and I was digging that some people had posted pictures about it. And then I came across Sean, and so that made my eyes spot. I was like, what? And then I read what the hell he'd written. And my heart started beating rapidly. I got dry mouth instantly. I started getting very nervous. When my eyes gravitated to the view counter, and it was almost at 10,000, I think. I mean, it was that many people that had seen this, and it's getting essentially nothing but supportive comments towards him, and not what I had done. I started to have a panic attack. I knew I had to leave work, and couldn't really explain as to why, but they let me go, and I drove to the parking lot and I just couldn't take my eyes off Twitter. For about two hours straight, I think. The next few days after that were really difficult. I don't know how much time I spent looking at comments. It just kept driving me nuts. Then a friend from Los Angeles texted me saying that Sean was talking about it on Facebook too, and I looked up Facebook and I was like, fuck. I realized how many people follow that publishing house, and people that I respect a great deal follow them and have seen this. Some of them even commenting on it. My name has been completely eroded now. I can't publish anything with this name on it. That name is now blacklisted. I'm certain he got enough information to other publishers to say not to work with me on anything I do going forward, even if it's a creation entirely my own. Sean's now got Trancus International involved somehow. He's definitely let the owners know what's going on. I can't do this. It was impossible, the kind of feeling I was going through at that time. And my partner was really struggling to understand what was going on. I mean, I had to walk through it step by step. It was hard. He wanted to be supportive. Clearly, we all know about copyright law, and that what I did was probably not the best advised thing in the world to do. But then the conversation should have been, well, why did Amazon let it go through in the first place? And why isn't anyone talking about that? Sean brought it up, that he was pissed off, that the KDP service had allowed this. Not only with mine, but with several others. I'm not the only one that's done something like this, and those are still sitting on Amazon. But I was the one that was talked about. I was the scapegoat because it's a big title. We have let the idea of success turn us hateful. We've gotten to a place where we are just so concerned that somebody is going to steal our ideas or what we've made that we are constantly destroying each other for creating things instead of working together against people who make millions of dollars every year on our labor. It's that you too can one day be a billionaire mindset. It's false. It's not going to happen. You will never be the guy lording over mountains of IP treasure. And if that is your goal, isn't that a disgusting aspiration? This mindset is explicitly designed rhetoric to get you to hate your fellow creators for breaking rules that the wealthy elite created to protect themselves and their assets. 
standards that they hold you to, to keep you in line. Another user in one of those threads said, It's annoying how people wreck things. It makes it more difficult for the good guys that are playing by the rules. Author Brennan LaFaro said, I don't know. I'm kind of glad that copyright exists and that people can't just write and sell whatever they want with my characters and stories. I just can't express enough that this is a false mentality to live and create by. Author Vicente Francisco Garcia was also very vocal about this situation, and at least to me, pretty much everything that he said was extremely misguided. Absolute yikes at how many people view stealing copyrighted works as undermining capitalism though, to be honest. I learned a lot today about how a subset of people seriously think this way, like their theft is some kind of altruistic act of radicalism. It's okay to steal if it's an IP. No, it's not. Fuck out of here with that nonsense. 99% of sensible people and authors support copyright, by the way. Just because you see a few weirdos on here spouting nonsense about it doesn't mean it's any kind of majority thinking. Author and publisher Sam Richard, who owns and runs the company Weird Punk Books, who puts out some really, really great titles that you should absolutely check out, came back at his reasoning with some strongly worded ideas. At first, Vicente called him out, but not by name, saying, It was just frustrating today because the anti-copyright people actually do act on their beliefs. I saw a well-known publisher openly wondering today if publishing illegally written books ignoring copyright at cons was the way to go because Amazon delists them. To which Richard said, Hi, I believe this is referring to me. For context, I was specifically talking about stuff like my friend's book Necromantic 3, which is a love letter to the Necromantic films, which at Press Rooster tried to publish under their new kink line but never came to light due to copyright. I was also thinking of the Adam Caesar, Shane McKenzie, Cameron Price book, Leprechaun in the Hood, the musical, the novelization. But Halloween 5 fits in here too, to a degree. My main point is that I'm not going to worry about IP infringement for corporate properties, by which I mean in terms of the ethical quandary involved. It's simply a non-issue for me. Don't get me wrong. It's dumb as hell to write an unauthorized novelization and not expect legal ramifications. But I'm talking ethically. These companies don't give a f oh. other than money. Author BC Howard also stepped in to defend Jake and back up Jaeger, also making some very good points as well. I'm sure that there were other people who were major players in this discussion that happened in these three days. But sorting through all the tweets is a difficult process. And I think the point has been made by now. But you know what I have to say to all of this? Pirate my videos if you want to. Download them and do as you wish. Put them on DVDs and sell them on your website. Take them to conventions and distribute them. I don't care. I have nearly 400,000 subscribers and people constantly take my work and put clips of it on Twitter. They put it on TikTok. They re-upload it to YouTube. They stream it on Twitch. But I still eat. I still pay my rent. I genuinely do not care because it doesn't actually affect me or the performance of my work. We're talking about such a small margin of people who engage in that kind of activity, and is just the reality of doing business in any field of entertainment. That is what you signed up for. That is what it means to be a public person. If you were to open up the floodgates and tell everyone to pirate your work, I bet you would be shocked to see that your bottom line isn't hurt to any noticeable degree. The rising tide lifts all boats. This Superstitious fear of piracy is a shroud that those with money have wrapped your eyes with and then told you to go hurt other people like you because you too could one day be like they are. We are living in unprecedented times. Writers are being paid less than they ever have. Major companies are actively trying to create machines that can automate the novel. Computers that can one day drive people out of creative jobs and force them into blue collar life. It is a mass extinction attempt on the career of the artist. We are on the front lines of a war against late stage capitalism's siege on art itself. Are we really going to spend precious time whacking each other with sticks and arguing on behalf of the people who are trying to destroy our livelihoods? Is that how we're going to do this? Do you not see that that is what they want? That in doing that, we are letting them win? While we squabble in the dirt like children saying, he took mine and she took his. They are laughing and counting their millions and billions that they took from all of us. Can't you see that? 
We are not each other's enemies here. And until we can start working together and unconditionally supporting each other's creativities, unique abilities, passions, and projects, we aren't going to get anywhere close to fixing this situation. Be love, be supportive, and take care of each other. Your fellow creators are all that you have in the end. And I assure you that the rising tide will always lift all boats. We are only strong when we are together. Jaeger himself at the end of all this said it better than I ever could. A snitch mindset and coward's heart will never earn you respect. Embracing rules will never compensate a life devoid of honor.